While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisee, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. Well, good morning, Covenant. Uh, It's good to see everyone. I have a question for you this morning to consider, and I want you to answer it in your head first. I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about it, and then I want you to share it with one or two people nearby, your answer. Are you ready for the question? So whatever pops in, however pops into your head, that's what I want you to share. I want you to answer this question right here. If you only have three or four, a handful of words or a simple phrase to describe who you are, your identity as a person. If you only have a few words, three or four or five words or a simple phrase to describe who you are as a person, your identity as a person, what would that be? I'm going to give you a few seconds to stare at me and think. Okay. When I say go, I want you to turn to somebody, at least one or two people near you, and share that answer. You ready? You have an answer? Go. It's a simple phrase, not a book, okay? All right. How many of you, your answer had something to do with your marital status? I'm a husband, I'm a wife, something like that. Raise your hand. All right. How many of you had had something to do with your parent status? I'm a parent, I'm a dad, I'm a mom, I'm a child. Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you had had something to do with your career? You know, I'm an engineer, doctor, whatever. Raise your hand. Okay. Teacher. Uh, How many of you, it had something to do with your spiritual state? Like I'm a Christian or I'm a pagan or whatever. Raise your hand. Okay. (laughs) All right, good. Uh, You know what I can guarantee? Uh, None of you turned to the other person and said, I'm a Pharisee, (laughs) right? That's just not a label that we use to describe ourselves, is it? Not nowadays, but I guarantee you that if Jesus had started his message uh, 2,000 years ago with a similar question, there would have been many people in that audience who would have said Pharisee, and the rest of the audience would have approved of that answer. Isn't that interesting? You see, in Jesus' time, Pharisees were well-respected. They had come about maybe around roughly 150 to 200 years before Jesus as a reaction to what was happening in their society in Israel, the way their nation was under such heinous leadership and oppression, the way the people were violating the law of God and living immoral lives. And so the Pharisees arose calling the nation to repentance, to obey the law of God, and to live lives that would bring honor to him. That's how they came into existence. That's pretty noble. But by the time of Jesus... But they had taken obedience to the law to an extreme. And they had added to it and it had become a source of pride, of works righteousness, and a source of oppression to the very people who looked up to them. And so in our passage this morning, Jesus runs aground of the Pharisees. It's not the first time it's ever happened, but here he confronts them face to face and he does not pull his punches in in his conversation with them. And in doing so, as a result, Jesus not only corrects their idea of righteousness and the law, but he also helps us to understand what it means to be righteous and how we become righteous. So there's several gospel applications from this passage this morning that touch on this. Let's start with the very first one. Religious activity and moral behavior 
can mask our true spiritual state. First application, religious activity and moral behavior can actually mask and hide our true spiritual state. In verse 37, he says, while Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and he reclined at the table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. Jesus didn't wash his hands. We're not talking about here dirt under the fingernails that was upsetting the Pharisees. They had very elaborate hand-washing ceremonies that were to make them ritually, religiously clean. In fact, if you go to the Mishnah, there's like seven pages of fine print that talks about how to properly or improperly wash your hands so that you are now ceremonially clean before God. Uh, They believed that when they walked out in the marketplace, for example, if they bumped into a Gentile, they were now unclean. And as a result, they could not participate in the worship at the synagogue or the temple until they became clean again. Or if they touched a, a piece of merchandise in the marketplace that had been touched by someone who was unclean, they were now unclean. And so before any meal, they would go through this ritual and sometimes even during the meal between courses, they would repeat it and Jesus has nothing to do with it. It's not that Jesus was violating the law. Far from it. The law did not require this. What what the Pharisees had done is they had created traditions around the law, and they had elevated those traditions to the level of God's word. Think of it like this. If if the law, law of God is a line in the sand that has been drawn that you should not cross, the Pharisees, they created this big fence around that line. And as long as they didn't go across the fence, they didn't have to worry about going across the line. You see how that can lead to all kinds of ideas? You know, you can't wear this, you can't do that. You, can't, you know, there's a lot of can'ts, a lot of don'ts are involved in this type of a life. You know, in, in our context today, if Pharisees were around, you know what they would look like? They would, they would look like fully engaged worshipers as our, pray, our, our worship team did such a phenomenal job this morning leading us in worship, and many of you, us, we were raising our hands and we were singing, I guarantee you the Pharisees would have been right there with us. Hands raised, exuberantly singing, saying amen. In fact, they would have already said amen to this sermon by now. Poor amen. pathetic people. Thank you. All right? Um, You know what? The finance team of our church would love the fact that we had 30 or 40 Pharisee families in our church. Because all the ministries of the church, we we wouldn't have a budget problem. They'd be taken care of because they tithed and they gave above their tithe. They were generous givers financially. If you had them at work with you, you'd want them on your project team. They were above and beyond. They were great employees or employers, husbands, above reproach, yet their inner life was a sinful mess. The very God that they claimed to worship and serve, they didn't even know him. And in this way, they were very similar to their forefathers. 700 years before in the book of Isaiah, God says to the Israelites, you have all of your elaborate worship you have your festivals in Isaiah 1. He says, you have your feast. You have your, you're sacrificing bulls and goats and lambs. And you have all of this religious activity. But your mouth may worship me, but your heart is far from me. And it makes me sick, God says. The Pharisees, they were continuing this practice. They were posers. They were hypocrites. And this passage, it's a huge warning for all of us. Just because we have our act together and just because we are morally good doesn't mean that we're a follower of Christ. Just because our lives are characterized by religious activity and coming to church and all that's entailed does not mean we are a follower of Christ. 
Just because you walked an aisle and said a prayer many years ago, and you may have even cried and been sincere, doesn't mean that you have a heart that loves Jesus. It doesn't mean that you have been born again and that you will spend eternity with God. Doesn't mean that at all. Just because you raise your hands and sing loud and pray eloquently, it doesn't mean that you're actually worshiping God. It is completely possible, and that's why this passage is so alarming. It is completely possible to have a wonderful life of religious activity and moral goodness and not know God or follow Jesus Christ. Our true spiritual state can be completely masked and hidden by our religious activity and moral behavior. Second application. God wants our external righteousness to be the fruit of an inner reality. God wants our external righteousness, our external lives, our external behavior to be the fruit of a true inner spiritual reality. And in talking about how you can have all of these things in order externally, I don't want to imply that God does not care about how we live in society and with one another externally. God does care, he's concerned with our external life and how we live in society, but when our external religious activity is not the fruit of an internal reality, ultimately, we end up doing great damage to ourselves and to other people. If you look in verse 39, he says, now you Pharisees, you cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You've taken care of all the outside, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness, you fools. Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? Verse 42, but woe to you Pharisees, For you tithe mint and rue and every herb. I mean, they didn't have to tithe the rue. It was a common herb that grew in the fields. Anybody could have it, but that's how meticulous they were. For you tithe mint and rue and every herb, and you neglect justice and the love of God. Verse 43, woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat and the synagogues and your greetings in the marketplace. Church. Moral obedience, a moral life, religious participation and activity that is divorced, that is divorced from the love of God, from Jesus Christ living within us and growing us from the inside out. A life that is divorced from that leads to self-centered pride and spiritual arrogance and deep, deep heart sins. And look good on the outside, but internally, just being corrupted by greed and all forms of wickedness, living like this, divorced from a true inner reality, does great damage to ourselves. Woe to you, Pharisees. This is an expression of judgment, of warning. Living like this actually stores up God's wrath to ourselves. If this is who we are, it hurts us but it also hurts other people. Verse 44, woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. What's that all about? You see, the law required that where someone was buried, there be a very clear marker. Because in the Old Testament law, to to touch a dead person, to touch a dead thing, to walk across a grave, that now made you unclean in the eyes of God. You could not then participate in the Passover. You couldn't go to the temple and participate in worship until you had been clean. You couldn't go to synagogue until you had been cleaned, right? And so in Jerusalem, especially around the time of Passover and the different feasts where the whole nation would come together, people would go out and make sure that the the markers were painted white in such a way so that everyone could see them because walking across that grave in accidentally now meant that you couldn't participate in the Day of Atonement or the Passover or whatever it was until you could become cleansed again. 
And so what Jesus is saying to these Pharisees, he's saying, you are full of your religious activity and your moral goodness, but in reality, you are a walking, talking source of corruption and uncleanness that affects everyone that you come into contact with. How brutal that assessment is, and honest, but how true. Woe to you, Pharisees. God cares about our external life and how we live, but he wants it to be the reflection of a true, renewed, spiritual inner life. How does that happen? He says to these Pharisees in verse 39, inside, you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms. Alms were the the monetary offering that that he would give to those in need or at their worship service. But give as alms those things that are within. Within what? You, that greed, that wickedness. Give those things as an alm to God. And behold, everything is now clean to you. He's saying to these Pharisees, he's saying to us this morning, instead of holding on to your reputation, instead of holding on to this false idea that I'm basically a good person, and so all that I have going on in my life that God honors me with is the result of me being good and and maybe even what Jesus does for me too. No, he says, bring to God the truth. The truth of ourselves is that we come into this life completely dead in our trespasses and sins. Romans 3, chapter uh, chapter 3, verse 10 says, there is no one of us who have been born who are good and righteous before God. And he even goes on further and says, it is impossible in verses 11 and 12 for you to even seek after God or to do one thing that is spiritually good and pleasing to God. That's why you can't even trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior unless God first intervenes in our lives and gives us a new heart that loves Jesus, that wants to believe the gospel. If God does not perform that miracle of regeneration in our hearts, none of us would ever turn from our sin and follow Jesus Christ. And so what he's telling these Pharisees is you need to turn to God and confess your sin. Express and confess that you are without hope apart from the God's mercy and his grace. Pharisees, you need to trust in the one that you're having brunch with and follow him. And that same message is true for you and me. For our inner life to become the source of a godly external life. It starts with us turning from our sin, confessing our sin, and turning to the one that we need to have brunch with and follow him. The scriptures tell us in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. If we turn from our sins and repent and confess and we turn to Christ and we receive him as our Savior and we confess him as our Lord, meaning I'm now yours. My life is your life. I follow you. You're my master. You're my king. My life is yours, Jesus. Have you ever had that experience with the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you turned from your sins? If you're here this morning and you're seeking answers to what's going on in your life, it all starts right there. Whether you were a Pharisee or the worst sinner in the, state of, uh, the nation of Israel at that time and today, The answer is the same. It starts right there. Confessing sin and turning to Christ as Lord and Savior. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. In this passage, right, we've seen a couple of important things. We've seen, right, that our external life can mask our true spiritual state. And we've seen that God does care about our external life. He wants it to be the fruit. He wants it to be the outgrowth of a new inner spiritual dynamic that seeks to bring glory to him. 
So if you've been changed, if you've experienced that saving grace from our Heavenly Father, what does it look like on the outside to reflect what is on the inside? For this, we have to go back to verse 42. Verse 42 is the central key verse in this passage. And what's interesting is as you look at the last third of that verse, you actually see Jesus practically rephrasing and giving a different perspective on the great commandment. You know what the great commandment is, right? This is where the, the Israelites asked Jesus, what are, the, what are the, the, the most important commandment for us to obey in order to please God and to live a godly life? And, and Jesus says, love the Lord your God with the entirety of your being and love your neighbor, love your fellow man as yourself. And you see this in verse 42, but he phrases it differently. Woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and you neglect justice and the law of the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the other. You see, a heart, and this is, this is the truth of what this passage is getting at, the heart that has been changed by God expresses itself through a righteous life that obeys him not out of obligation and duty, but obeys him out of love and seeks justice for others in need. What does that look like? Externally, what is our life supposed to look like? If we have followed and committed our life to Christ and he's at work in our hearts, it's a life, it's a righteous life that obeys him out of love and seeks justice for those in need. Let's dig in to those last two qualifying phrases in that sentence, right? Obeys him out of love. In verse 42, he says, these you ought to have done. He commends the Pharisees for something, for obeying what the Bible said about giving. And he could have given any number of examples, but in this case, he used tithing because they even went further than what the Bible required in their giving. You see, church, God has expressed his will. He's expressed how he wants to be worshipped in the scriptures. He's expressed how we are to serve him in the scriptures. He's expressed to us in the scriptures what it looks like to obey him. So obeying the scriptures out of love, not out of a sense of pride or arrogance or self-will and self-power, but obeying God out of love and gratitude for what God has done in our lives, his grace that he has poured into our lives through Jesus Christ, obeying him from that position and perspective, that is a key indicator of an internal heart change. In, in other words, why do you do what you do? Why are you here this morning singing? Why in a few moments are you going to give in the offering? Why, why do you participate in a small group? Why do you help your neighbor who's in need? Why do you volunteer in the nursery? Why do you get involved with Covenant Cove? Why do you come out here on Saturday mornings with Roar Sports? Your heart's condition. How you answer that why question reveals your heart. It's important. Are we doing these things out of love and gratitude for God's grace? A righteous life obeys him out of love. A righteous life seeks justice for others in need. Now, in verse 42, Jesus says it more negatively. He indicts the Pharisees. He says, you neglect justice and the law of God. You remember that accusation in Isaiah 1 that I referred to a couple minutes ago where, where God said, I am sickened by all of your worship and all of these things that you do to impress me. Well, if you read on in chapter 1 of Isaiah, in verse 16, this is how he continues. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil. Now church, read it aloud with me, verse 17, ready? Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. <clears throat> you, you see how this lines up 
with verse 42, the symmetry that is here. And the Pharisees, they love the law. And they had all of this religious activity going on, yet Jesus says they were actually repudiating and denying the very God they claimed to worship and serve because they neglected justice and the love of God. Why is that the case? Why is this the, the indictment? You remember a couple minutes ago, we, we did a little exercise. You identified yourself, right? Hopefully nobody identified themselves as a Patriots fan, right? On um, to this day today, right? But you identified yourself with a few words. I know some of you did. You need to get right with God. Um, <laughs> so you identified yourself with some words or phrases, but church, guess what? God, in the scriptures, he's revealed himself. He's identified himself. He's revealed himself as the one who is just and who is concerned that all of his people who have been created in his image are treated justly. In Psalm chapter 68, verse 4, God says, Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord. Exult before him. And listen to the phrase, the words that he chooses to identify himself with. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. In the book of Jeremiah, God is bringing charges against the king who is leading the people perversely. He says, do you think you are a king because you compete in cedar? You build these palaces and these castles and you line them with fine cedar wood. Do you think that's what makes you a king? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Then it was well. And listen to this next statement. Is not this to know me, declares the Lord. Doing justice and righteousness. God says, this is knowing me. This is how, this is who I am. And Micah chapter 6, a, a verse many of you are familiar with. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Now, the theme of justice and doing justice is all throughout the Bible. But you know, I have a confession this morning. 20 years ago, when I came into a church like this one, Pinewood Church up in Orange Park, I had a very one-sided understanding of doing justice and what this passage is getting at. But in that church, Catherine and I, for the, maybe for the first time in our lives, were the recipients of people who were doing justice and righteousness. And, and I was introduced to the, the, the preaching and the writings of Tim Keller, one of our pastors in our denomination, who has written books and talked extensively on this subject. You know, he, he points something really important out. There's two words in the Hebrew Old Testament and this theme of justice that are often used. The, the first word is mishpat, right? Mishpat, and you'll see it's translated as justi justice. It means the correction of wrong, the punishment of evil, equity, and consistent application of laws for all people. All are equal under the law. And this was, honestly, this was my understanding of justice. This dimension of justice, right? We should be a defender of those who are the victim of crime. And let's find the criminals and let's punish them. That's law enforcement and justice. And, and by the way, this is an important aspect of justice. But it's really more than just punishment and retribution. It's more than a corrective word. It also means that people receive what they're due, their rights. 
You know, our founding documents as a nation talk about us having inalienable rights. And what is the basis for those inalienable rights? We are all created equal before God. We all are created in the image of God. So therefore, whether whatever our skin color, our economic or educational conditions, whatever it may be, there are certain things that we have a right to because we're created in the image of God. And Mishpat is doing justice for those who, for some reason, are not receiving their rights. Another word translated as justice, also righteousness, is zadakah. And it means day-to-day living in which a person conducts all relationships in his family and society with fairness, generosity, and equity. You know, uh, Mishpah, that it is kind of a corrective, rectifying justice. Keller points out that this word is preventative justice. In other words, if everyone in our society was living according to Zedekah, we would never need Mishpah. Get it? Because in all of our relationships and how we interacted with people, we would treat them with fairness, generosity, and equity. These two words are so important. They appear throughout the scriptures together. We saw it in Jeremiah, right? The king that was praised. He said, why is he praised? He said, your father, he did justice and righteousness, and it was well with him. That's these two words. In Psalm 33, verse 5, the Lord loves righteousness and justice. These two words. The earth is full of his unfailing love. So what does it mean for us to do justice? To live justice, to not neglect neglect justice and the love of God. Doing justice, as we see from these words and the scriptures, means that we are in relationship with people who are at risk and we love them. We're at relation in relationship, and these these relationships they provoke actions on their behalf. And those actions, they include the rectifying of abuse and seeking long-term solutions to their problems. These ministry partners are not interested in putting a Band-Aid on someone's problem. What are they seeking? They're seeking to to maybe have to put a Band-Aid to rectify the immediate need, but partners, your ultimate goal is what? Solve the problem that is in that person's life. This is doing justice. We do justice when we actively get involved through generous giving and personal service to address the pain, the needs, and the plight of those in our community who are at risk. Who's at risk? It's the same people who were at risk in Jesus' time. The same people who were taught to do justice to in Jesus' time. It's the widow. The person who's all by themselves, maybe either a widow or a single mom who's trying to do life or a single dad on their own. It's the orphan, the one who doesn't have parents. Maybe they have biological parents, but they're so addicted to drugs, their life is a tragedy. It's the immigrant. This is a hot topic button right now, but in Scripture, God's people love and care for those who live in their midst who are not even citizens of their country. Regardless of what's going on politically, the church loves them. It's the hungry. It's the homeless. It's the sick. It's the handicapped. Those who are, who are so disadvantaged in our society. It's the person who is enslaved to sin through addiction. It's the person who was wounded by sin because they have been abused or taken advantage of, and as a result, they can't thrive on their own. It's the person who's been on the receiving end of bigotry and racism and prejudice, and as a result, they can't get ahead or they're hurt, and they can't get past those obstacles and thrive. Tim Keller says this, 
If you are trying to live a life in accordance with the Bible, the concept and call to justice are inescapable. We do justice when we give all human beings their due as creations of God. Doing justice includes not only the righting of wrongs, but generosity and social concern, especially toward the poor and the vulnerable. Church, doing justice is at the heart of our mission as a church. Our mission is what we are here to do, what God has given us to do. And what is our mission? It is to bring gospel restoration to people's deepest needs and our broken world. Do you hear how that screams doing justice? What is everyone's deepest need? First and foremost is to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And this is why as a church, as part of our mission, we're encouraging you to come and learn how to share your faith. And we teach you and we'll walk with you so that you can address the deepest need every person has to know Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior. This is why we have a recovery ministry in our church so that we can do justice, we can bring justice into the life of those who are enslaved to substances or practices that are sin. This is why we have a sexual abuse recovery, because some of you, your life has been so drastically affected. So many of us today have experienced this in our past, and it still dominates our present. We need freedom from this. This is why we have a mercy team, a group of deacons, and they take that money that you give and you designate for mercy, and they help couples who need counseling so their marriage doesn't fall apart. They help people who need financial assistance so that their electricity doesn't get turned off or their car gets repaired so that they can go to work, and they administer this. They're doing justice for people in our church and people in our community who need this. And church, this is why we have these men and women here this morning, people who are on the front lines of doing justice in our city with those who are most at risk. Many of the most at risk we're insulated from in the neighborhoods that we live in, the most obviously at risk. Don't get me wrong. You can live in a fine, fine neighborhood and it's filled with people who have deep needs that only the gospel can heal. But the reason why we bring in these partners into you this morning is they're on that front line and, and not only do we want to give them money, not only do we want to give them more money, this is why, this is why we give to our, in our offering. A portion of our tithes go to support these ministries and, and we should be giving them more. And there are more ministries that we would like to adopt. And so when we give generously, this allows us to do this and we bring these men and women in. We want you to get to know them. And as we kick off Love Brevard, and as a church, we mobilize with 30, 40 other churches that we go into the community. We want to come alongside and serve with them and get to know them and that work that is doing. Of all the people in this world who should do justice, it's those of us who have experienced the redeeming grace of our Heavenly Father. I mean, you think about it. Jesus Christ he looked and he saw that there was a people at risk. You and I, our sins had separated us from eternity with God and having a relationship with God. So what did Jesus do? He entered into a relationship with us. He came to earth and he took on human flesh and he walked among us and he faced the justice of God towards our sins and he satisfied that justice and he redeemed us and gave us new life. Of all the people who should want to do justice, it's us. Because we've experienced the blessing of someone doing justice for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, may you do this work in our lives and in our church. As we gear up into this season where we're, we're spreading out across Brevard, May for many of us, perhaps, this be the first time we truly have our eyes opened to the needs that are in our very own backyard. And Lord, may it not just be a, a one-time engagement that we can then go back to our comfortable lives and, and check that box. May it truly be the outgrowth, the fruit 
of an inner life that has been gloriously changed by the gospel that is humbled and grateful for you, Lord Jesus, doing justice for us. Make us that kind of church, I ask. Make me that kind of pastor. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.